Portland wants to be a respectable, middle-class, nice, clean town, and it is. But historically, there's a whole undercurrent of violence and sexual exploitation and exploitation of workers in this town that's been going on since the very start. By the late 1800s, Portland's waterfront had an international reputation for vice and violence. The crime, prostitution, drug abuse, murder. It is very difficult to conceive that there weren't a lot of backroom deals going on. Everybody was involved in it. Stories from the era are legendary. Sailors would talk about going from port to port, saying things like, well, I was shanghai in San Francisco for Portland, and then I got shanghai for, for Shanghai, you know. <laughs> what is history and what is myth? And is there kind of a gray area between the two? <laughs> Funding for Oregon Experience is provided by the Robert D. and Marsha H. Randall Fund for Lifelong Learning, the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation, the Oregon Cultural Trust, additional support provided by the Clark Foundation, the Roundhouse Foundation, Fran and John von Schlegel, and viewers like you. Thank you. Portland's early waterfront is the setting for legendary tales of an illicit past. The stories have become a part of local lore, even when they seem too incredible to be true. All right, everybody, we are gonna go ahead and start the tour, so come on this way. We're gonna come on over to the Skidmore Fountain. As we look at our history today, we're gonna take a look at a whole bunch of different stories. We're gonna just try to separate what might be true and what might be, well, kind of true. Bunko Kelly is who we're gonna talk about next. He was quite a crimp and all-star. One of the most famous stories in Portland waterfront history is about Joseph Bunko Kelly, a notorious criminal who worked the docks. Kelly is looking for somebody to put aboard this ship called the Flying Prince. It's got a name, the Flying Prince. Bunko had been walking along the street, uh, smelled a very strange smell, saw an open trap door, went down inside the room and saw these men had obviously thought that they were breaking into the barrels from the Snug Harbor Saloon, but actually they were barrels of embalming fluid. The story goes, as the men lay dying, Bunko saw an opportunity. He sold the men to a ship in need of sailors and told the captain the men were drunk, dead drunk. Well, there's a few things wrong with it. I don't care how much of a wino you are. I don't think you're going to think maldehyde is something to drink. I know in this day, if we found 24 dead sailors in the hold of a ship, it would be a huge story. But was the story true? Researchers have found nothing in the newspapers from the time period. The city directory doesn't list the saloon or undertaker. Official shipping records don't include the Flying Prince. It's a great legend, but Bunko probably told it himself, so you know it's not true. <laughs> uh, I think legends are a really important part of history. Um, they help to create the cultural identity of a city. It's just one of many stories of Portland's notorious past. So next, we're gonna move on and talk a bit about this crimping and shanghaiing business here in Portland. Modern audiences continue to be fascinated by tales of painted ladies, underworld characters, and shanghai sailors. One of my favorite ways to learn history is to take legends about Portland history and fact check, find out what the truth is behind those things. The real story of Portland's modern waterfront begins in the early 1800s, when seagoing ships traveled inland to reach a place known as the Clearing. 
The clearing was a, a place that was literally halfway between Fort Vancouver and the Willamette Falls. Over time, white traders set up wharves and warehouses, creating a small village. One of them was Massachusetts Sea Captain John Cooch. He owned 640 acres along the northwest waterfront that he platted for development. It was a square mile and encompassed what is known today as Portland's Old Town Historic District. One of the first things that the original settlers did after they built a dock is they built a plank road that could allow the farmers from the Tualatin Valley to bring their wheat to Portland. So shipping wheat became a really big industry right from the start. In 1850, Captain Cooch sailed to Hong Kong in a brig loaded with locally produced wheat, lumber, and flour. The following year, in 1851, Portland was incorporated as a city, second only to San Francisco as a metropolis of the far west. It boasted 821 residents, more than 600 of them men. William S. Ladd, one of our most famous city founders, came here in 1851 with a load of wholesale liquor. It was the basis for his huge fortune later, and it was the basis for the fortune for a lot of the town founders. Ladd's operation was just one of over 30 businesses in town, including a Chinese boarding house and a new newspaper called The Oregonian. Right away, the city constructed its first official building, a jail, and appointed a town marshal. The marshal system was the type of thing where you pay as you go. You pay him based upon the job that he did. If he impounded dogs, if he collected taxes, if he arrested somebody, if he lit the lamps at night, then he would build a city. At first, a single marshal worked the entire city, and liquor laws were only enforced when absolutely necessary. The city council must address whether or not the marshal can stop the nightly riotous proceedings on the waterfront. Captain John Cooch, 1861. Portland got a reputation early as a wide open town where you could do what you wanted. Gambling was open, lots of alcohol, prostitution was open. By 1870, the population had grown tenfold to 8,000. While a few prominent families settled into stately homes, building churches and businesses away from the waterfront, the bulk of the population still consisted of young men, working as laborers in the region's forests, fields, and mines. A lot of this is very seasonal, unskilled labor. So a lot of these men needed somewhere to stay in between the seasons. So there were a lot of men there for months, lots of idle time on their hands. A lot of times they'd come back from the woods with a big purse and they'd want to spend that money. And there were people more than willing to help them dispense with some of that hard earned cash. The men congregated along the waterfront, which was quickly becoming an undesirable part of town. It wasn't a great thing to be next to the river. It was kind of a terrible thing. Most, you could get used to the smell. <laughs> People thought of it more as a sewer than they did a river. The area was prone to seasonal floods. It was busy, dirty, and catered to the shipping trade, including rows of cheap boarding houses, prostitute rooms called cribs, and endless saloons. Today we're gonna talk about a few ghost bars. We're gonna talk about bars that aren't there anymore, that were thriving at one point, and uh, today we're just kind of left with the shell or the memory Across the street, we have Erickson Saloon, which was established by Finnish immigrant August Erickson in the 1880s. Erickson Saloon, uh, like all saloons, claimed that they were unrivaled in the Western world, but this one may actually be true. They had a bar that was 684 feet long, uh, possibly the largest bar in the United States at that time. I mean, the actual place where you sit down and drink was 684 feet long. It spanned almost a block. When the flood of 1894 swept into the bar, Erickson chartered a scow, stocked it with liquor, and business continued as usual. Erickson was the most famous saloon, 
but Portland would have hundreds. In 1869, the city issued over 200 liquor licenses. That's one for every 40 people, not counting the numerous unlicensed operations. The crimes that you see going through the police blotter in the 1870s were largely alcohol related. Jim Huff is the director of the Portland Police Museum. These are the actual logs from the first weeks of a full-time police bureau. Lying drunk in the street and assault and battery, drunk and disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace by blowing a police whistle. This poor guy, he was arrested for larceny of a watch Teeth very bad and several gone. Large, deep scar center of her forehead. Several scars, top of head. You gotta think he had a rough, a rough life. In Portland, you had a whole group of people who lived hand to mouth. A lot of poverty, a lot of crime in Portland caused by the drinking. In 1870, a third of the city's revenue came from liquor licensing fees, and prominent city leaders owned and operated saloons including the city marshal, James LaPeus, who operated the Orofino. Which was a bar, dance hall, meeting house, probably the first uh, police station in town. It was also where Portland lost its first police officer in the line of duty, shot by a drunk firing in the street. A few years later, another officer would be killed at the bar next door. Policing the city was dangerous and officers were expected to take care of themselves. They were called bulls, they were big guys. So you wanted someone who could, who could handle themselves in a fight. In 1870, the city formed a full-time police force, appointing Marshal LaPeus the chief of police. He would serve off and on for more than two decades. He was probably the first career law enforcement officer of Portland, uh, the man who established a viable police force but he also set kind of a dishonest tone for the police force uh, because he was accused of bribery over and over and over in his career. The first thing I did when I took charge of this hellhole was to fix the policeman on my beat, Edward Chambro, saloon owner. In the spring of 1874, the Portland Women's Temperance League tried to put an end to the drinking. Their first target was the Webfoot Saloon. For hours, they prayed and sang outside the bar as patrons heckled and even attacked them. These women were very determined, and uh, they were determined to shut this bar down. Police Chief Lopez arrested them for disorderly praying. They served one day in jail. The women's tactics didn't stop the vice. In fact, it was about to get worse. So the population is very male, but they had a lot of lady friends or special ladies to help the men with those wages that they earned in the woods. These women and other sex workers are really given very little value by society. Glamorized images of prostitution didn't reflect the realities of women's lives. Most were poor and uneducated with few options. It's an incredibly sad story for the lives of these women because afterwards they would frequently end up with all kinds of uh, venereal diseases and their lifespan was very, very short. And they were literally left in some of these crib areas to die. In the 1880 census, 58 women listed their occupation as prostitute. Unofficially, there were many more, most residing in an area known as Whitechapel, named after the infamous region of London stalked by Jack the Ripper. There are endless rows of girls. The older ones have eyes that look straight out of hell itself. Hayes Perkins. Prostitution wasn't illegal in Portland until 1871, and then rarely enforced. The women were more likely to be arrested for stealing from the men. That's just what happened in 1881 
when James Brown told police he'd been robbed in Carrie Bradley's bordello. Brown ended up dead in the river. The story was a sensation that became a part of Portland lore. Her trial became a real important political development in town um, because of the bribe that she paid to Chief LaPaz. He was never convicted. There's a pretty good chance that he did take it. Carrie Bradley was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to 12 years in prison. LaPaz was soon removed from office over other bribery allegations. Their stories are well documented, but many other sensational crimes are long forgotten. Gong Fa was a young Chinese American woman. She lived right across the street from the police department, uh, right in the heart of Chinatown. And one night in 1893, her throat was cut on the street, right under the great big electric light. Her murder remains unsolved, along with the axe murder of a French prostitute just a few years earlier. Nobody cared because all the people in that position were um, the, the very poorest. There are people with no power whatsoever, no money. If you were a vagrant, you were in town, you had no means of support. You had no job. You were arrested, you were brought in. You had a choice, you could either pay a fine, you could work on the rock pile, you could go to jail, or you could leave town. One way to leave town was by joining a ship. For men with few options, the sea could provide a living. Why did I ever come into the world where one has to be a rogue to live? I'm going to Portland and try for a ship. Maybe better fortune is there. At least I hope so. Hayes Perkins, 1898. By the late 1870s, there was a constant demand for sailors. The Pacific Grain Fleet shipped thousands of tons of Willamette Valley wheat to Great Britain. Over 100 vessels loaded on Portland's many docks. If enough able-bodied sailors weren't available, then an unlucky few could end up shanghaied. Shanghaiing is a process where you're drinking in a saloon down in the North End, and you got a great new buddy who's buying you drinks, and all of a sudden you don't feel very good, and you wake up three days later off of the coast of Astoria on a bark, and somebody's kicking you in the ribs saying, get to work. And the life of a sailor was horrible at that time. And the life of a logger who was all of a sudden a sailor <laughs> would have been even more horrible, I assume. Sailors were required to sign a contract known as ship's articles. Once they did, they belonged to the ship and couldn't collect their pay until the contract was fulfilled. It didn't even matter if your signature was forged uh, because the sailors' boarding house managers had a very good relationship with port officials. They had the law on their side. The U.S. Supreme Court had ruled that sailors were not protected under the 13th Amendment. They could not terminate their employment even when conditions were unbearable. If you can imagine being on a very small ship, a yacht by today's standards, they ate a lot of uh, hard tack, which is like biscuits that usually didn't last very long before they were full of worms. The food is poor, a glue-like mess. The old sea dogs laugh and say, we will see much worse than this. Hayes Perkins, 1898. After three months of that, Coming into land is exciting enough, but then you come into Portland and most sailors were ready to have some uh, change of scenery. Once at port, many men simply deserted their ships and their contracts, forfeiting their wages. They were easy prey for crimps. The crimps were a con man. The crimp is the one who supplies um, sailors for the ship. The crimps would come on board the ship and they would tell these men, Hey, you know, I can put you up at my boarding house. We've got girls there. We've got good food. We've got a bar. You don't have to pay for anything. Let's come on down. Oh, here's a bottle of liquor, by the way. And the captain would be A-OK -okay with this arrangement because they're breaking their contract, the sailor is, so the captain doesn't have to pay that sailor. Now, these guys had run up pretty big bills at that point because they'd been living at the boarding house and drinking and maybe gambling, indulging in prostitution, whatever they were, they were having a good time. They were, they were having their shore time. With no money to pay the bill, the sailor had little choice but to sign up for a new ship. I'm here in the boarding house for better or for worse. I want to go to sea. Hayes Perkins. The crimp acted as a go-between, finding a ship for the sailor. 
The sailors' future wages went to the crimp to pay off the sailors' debts. This was known as blood money. So there were sailors who sailed around the world for their entire lives and um, never made any money. They went from boarding house to boarding house. This was legal. This was the way the system worked. Blood money was the grease that made the sailors' boarding houses work, and they, they worked all over the world. In Portland, the practice reportedly started with a man named Jim Turk, who opened the first sailors' boarding house in 1871, called the Sailors' Rest. He was uh, a big, violent man. He was really addicted to violence. Uh, you see, over and over again, um, he beat police, government officials, sailors, strangers on the street, members of his family. Well, his wife, Kate, was as big a drunk as he was, if not bigger. They were constantly in the newspapers. You'll find headlines like Turk again. Over time, there would be other boarding house masters in town, including Larry Sullivan, who was known as the Kingmaker. Larry Sullivan, I kind of think of as Portland's first organized crime boss. Um, he was highly organized. He was extremely violent. Uh, there were several cases of uh, violent beatings on the street. Larry Sullivan runs this place. He is head man and a surly brute who bullies the men cruelly. Hayes Perkins, 1898. For a time, the city granted Sullivan a monopoly on sailors' boarding houses. He ran the waterfront and influenced politics. He would get votes by encouraging all the winos and whoever else he could find down there to vote. And if Sullivan asked you to vote, then you voted. <laughs> and I remember reading about how one time he, he asked an entire crew of a Danish ship to vote, and they voted. Larry Sullivan may have been the first crime boss, but others would soon follow. This is not the location of historic Chinatown. Chinatown was actually in that direction to the south of us in downtown Portland. Beginning in the 1850s, Chinese laborers arrived in the U.S. to work the California gold fields. As their numbers increased, so did hostility against them. They faced violence and discrimination almost everywhere they went. As they were chased out of small communities in California, they looked for another place to go, and Oregon was, was the place to relocate. In Portland, like other areas, the Chinese suffered hardships but they also found a measure of protection, both by the newspapers and city leaders. Can we suppose that special privileges will be granted to our people in China if we allow Chinese in this country to be treated with injustice and brutality? Harvey Scott, The Oregonian, 1869. The city, the administrators were incredibly progressive. They may not have cared for the Chinese, but they also knew that the the passage of restrictive laws was not constitutional. It's an incredibly different position than what you would see uh, passing in California. Portland developed two distinct Chinese communities, one made up of rural agricultural workers, the other made up of transient laborers and merchants. Portland's Chinese population was second only to San Francisco, but without a designated Chinese district. When the Chinese started moving into Portland, they could literally live anywhere where a person was willing to rent them properties. And that's exactly what they did. In terms of geography, it was much larger than San Francisco. At one time, they were occupying in excess of 70 blocks. The 1880 Portland census listed 1,600 Chinese. Just 65 of them were women. For decades, U.S. law made it difficult for Chinese women to enter the country. That is going to have a tremendous impact on the development of families. The men are finding other pastimes as a substitute for the families that they don't have. There was a lot of opium smoking going on. There was prostitution happening. There was gambling. Almost all of it operated through Chinese syndicates known as tongs. 
this was a huge economic issue, and the Tongs were very interested in protecting that investment. Rival Tongs battled over turf, and a series of Tong wars literally spilled out into the streets. Police eventually tried to crack down with a series of ordinances against gambling, opium, and secret rooms, but that only drove activity even further into hiding. The buildings in Chinatown at that time were mostly made out of wood, and uh, they had courtyards inside. And a lot of the Chinese would build over those courtyards or add on to the houses. So they became kind of a little warren of secret passages and different rooms and things like that. They had opium dens and gambling dens and often had secret passages so if there was a police raid, they could get away. It perpetuated a myth that the Chinese were living underground. Now, in reality, they did protect their people and they did it through these convoluted hallways, false doors, uh, and even false bottoms and floors. Yes, they would do that. But as far as digging underground tunnels, that's something that is not really, uh, I'm, I'm gonna say that's not really well proven. Eventually, the waterfront changed. The Chinese migrated to New Chinatown further north. The widow of Captain John Cooch battled the city to keep her property, but lost it to make way for the Burnside Bridge. The tall sailing ships were replaced by steam, and the West Side wharves were demolished. A seawall was finally built in 1920, and then Harbor Drive was placed here in 1940, and access to the river was basically removed. Remnants of the old waterfront disappeared, but the stories lingered. In the 1930s, Northwest author Stuart Holbrook wrote a series of articles on Portland's sordid history for the Oregonian. They were based on tales he'd heard from old timers. They were wonderful, wonderful tales of dead men at the bottom of a ladder. It was Holbrook who first pinned the story of the Shanghai men that drank formaldehyde, along with many other tales of the region's past. In the stories themselves, they say, I don't know if this is really true. <laughs> In fact, they knew it probably wasn't really true, but it was a good story. So that's why we remember Bunko Kelly, because of these stories that Stuart Holbrook published in the 1930s. The stories became a part of Portland's Old Town lore. They represent both tall tales and harsh realities that still linger in today's waterfront district. When you stumble across something in history that that lets you get a real feel for the place. It surprises you. And I think that we would be surprised at just how different Portland was then from now, back in the bad old days. There's more about Portland Noir on Oregon Experience online. To learn more or to order a DVD of the show, visit opb.org. Funding for Oregon Experience is provided by the Robert D. and Marsha H. Randall Fund for Lifelong Learning, the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation, the Oregon Cultural Trust, additional support provided by the Clark Foundation, the Roundhouse Foundation, Fran and John von Schlegel, and viewers like you. Thank you. <laughs>